again, welcome. And it's a, it's a huge privilege to have Alexander with us this morning. Alexander is um, you are quite familiar to many of you and um, has been a regular speaker at TJF over the years. He's often spoken for us in person at uh, Seattle. So just to say that Alexander Fenter, I've known Alexander, he was um, has been in the vineyard on the national leadership of the vineyard for many years. He's retired at the moment, semi-retired, if I can put it like that, semi-retired in Belita and joining us from uh, Belita on the Natal North Coast. And Alexander, as long as I've known Alexander, he has had a, a deep passion for, for authentic spirituality, discipleship, a real love for Jesus and his church. And he's published a, a number of books and speaks uh, quite regularly all over the world on different topics. And But I just wanted to draw your attention to his latest book, which is Doing Spirituality, um, which I think is, yeah, I think Alexander said to me, his, his most important work so far, talking about authentic spirituality. And so the reason I share that with you is so A, that you all go out and get the book, but more importantly, because it links into this morning's topic. And I think that's really as particularly in, in the light of the, the news that has come out about Ravi Zechariah over the last um, sort of six months even and even longer in actual fact. Alexander responded to that, I think initially on Facebook and then wrote a paper. So he'll refer to that um, quite extensively during this talk and it is in the chat. So the first paste in the chat is a mistake. So just ignore that. And the second paste that says um, alexanderfenter.com is in actual fact Alexander's written response um, to this recent topic, but as well as this crisis of spirituality um, in the church today. So enough from me, Alexander. Again, welcome and um, thank you for sharing and, and joining with us this morning. So over to you. Thank you very much, Wayne. And thank you to everyone. Um, Lovely to be with you all. Thank you for waking up so early. And uh, TGI, you guys start really early. <laughs> but um, it's again an honor to be with you. So thanks to Torsten and to Wayne for arranging this and for hosting this. Um, yeah, so maybe for all of us who've now joined and are together, and maybe one or two others will still join, let's just begin with a word of prayer. Jesus, we acknowledge your presence. We acknowledge your kingship. We acknowledge your love and your mercy and your grace. We receive your Holy Spirit poured out from you, Jesus, the head of the church, and from the Father, the Father of all love and all mercy. We receive you, Holy Spirit. Come and speak to us. Come and work in our hearts and in our minds. God, you know how much we need you, not only individually, as, as the church, as your church. Jesus, Jesus, we need you. We need your forgiveness. We need your mercy. We need your transformation. So, Holy Spirit of God, work with us in this hour together. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, um, so what I want to do in addressing this, this topic um, that uh, Torsten and I agreed on when we spoke, the crisis of moral failure in the church, and in the background on my computer monitor, I've got my document, which I want to just refer to one or two points as we go through it. And as Wayne said that uh, in the chat box, the second link that I posted is a link to this document in terms of a deeper response to um, yeah, fallen leaders or leaders who end up living a double life. So the question really uh, essentially is, how do we respond to the moral bankruptcy in the church? Um, how do we explain it? How do we process it? And especially, obviously, when it is symbolized, and it is dramatically publicly symbolized in 
like Ravi Zacharias, where after his death, all, all of these accusations came out more and more, although they did come out while he was alive through a woman, Tori Thompson in Canada, um, of basically sexual abuse and including spiritual abuse. And then, of course, after, especially after one's death, the stuff comes out and then the organization has a problem, the directors to, to, to deal with it, to face it. Um, and then it, it, it just becomes a, a terrible crisis of credibility and shame and guilt for not only Christian leaders, but for Christians and for the church. And, and in a sense, tragically, the world laughs. So this is a very, very serious matter. We cannot take it lightly. And uh, I personally was, uh, was really, uh, um, yeah, uh, broken and shattered by Rabbi Zacharias. I held him in very high regard, but perhaps more so Jean Vanier, those of you who know Henry Nowen, who went to work with Jean Vanier in Lash communities, uh, equally after his death, six women came forward and accused them um, of rape and uh, sexual abuse and uh, spiritual abuse as well, spiritualizing these sexual encounters. And I mean, it's just shattering. It is just shattering. So um, we, we as Christians have got to walk humbly. You know, I always think of this. I always begin with in, in my mind with Micah 6 verse 8. What does God require of you? Um, to do justice to love mercy and to walk humbly with God. And when we think of the church and especially Christian leaders and especially male Christian leaders in the eyes of the world, we really need to walk humbly because we are tainted with the same brush and the same question mark of credibility hangs over us. Is our integrity intact? So it's to really seek to treat people as God treats people. That's the, the word tzedak in the Hebrew justice um, is actually righteousness, right way of relating, right way of behaving, right way of thinking, right way of speaking, right way of living, righteousness, which all essentially is, it is about um, the horizontal relationship of treating people as God would more than this private individual question of morality, you know, moral purity. Um, what is seen visibly in my mind of other human beings actually reveals the truth or lack thereof of my relationship with God. And so the repeated refrain in the New Testament is, how can you say that you love God whom you haven't seen and yet you don't love your neighbor whom you have seen, who is visible? So our treatment of concrete people around us day in and day out actually um, is the proof of the reality or lack thereof of our inner morality, our relationship, our, spiritual, our relationship with God, our spirituality. So what does God require of us is to, is to do justice, to love mercy. And there again, we're not reacting here to stuff like with Ravi Zacharias, with um, judgmental uh, superiority. You know, I think of Paul, he who thinks they stand, take heed lest they fall. So if we're going to err, we need to err on the side of mercy and grace. And uh, just this week, Jill and I were in our home group here um, um, in Salt Rock, our weekly home group, and we dealt with the leader of the home group did Psalm 51 on Tuesday night. And uh, I just am so reminded of David's cry, create in me a clean heart, O God, renew a right spirit within me. Uh, take not your Holy Spirit away from me, cast me not away from your presence, and is crying out to God for forgiveness. So God is a merciful God. God is a gracious God who forgives and we need to be merciful and gracious. But having said that, friends, we need to walk humbly before God and the nation and the nations of the world, especially as male leaders, because we need to face the fact of what goes wrong and why it goes wrong and account for it. And I had a number of people at the time with Rabbi Zacharias 
um, the stuff that came out in, in February from the official 12 page report of this uh, company, Martin and Miller, uh, a forensic investigative company. Um, many, uh, well, a number of people contacted me personally after my Facebook post about it, saying, how on earth do they understand this? And the question of faith and disillusionment in terms of God and Christian faith, etc. So we have to face the fact, what happened, why it happened, and how can we hold ourselves and each other accountable so that it does not happen as often as it seems to be happening because God's taking the rap off things. And uh, I, you know, for me, as I understand Paul's teaching in the New Testament, God takes the rap off us in our lifetime by bringing discipline, exposing us for our, our weakness and brokenness. Or if it doesn't happen in our lifetime from time to time, then it happens after our death, as has happened with Rabbi Zacharias. It certainly will happen when we appear before the throne of Jesus Christ. As Paul says, that we must all appear before the judgment seat, the bima of Jesus Christ, uh, to receive what we have done in our bodies, whether good or bad. So we will all count one day. Therefore, we do need to face the tough questions and probe them. So what I want to do is then just respond to some of those questions and uh, also in the process referred to my paper, which the link is there and you're welcome to read it. So just first of all, to say in situations like this, for me, I always just feel uh, the grief uh, to turn to God and confess my own sins, Rabbi Zacharias's sins, our sins as leaders, because it, whether it's just because of um, the internet highway and the global village, we hear so much more of this type of stuff coming out, uh, uh, not only in the Catholic Church with priests, but the Evangelical Church, the Charismatic Church, Pentecostal Church, across the board. And it's just uh, a crying shame. So first of all, I think we need to humble ourselves before God, cry out for forgiveness, and like Daniel, not only confess uh, the, the sins of fallen leaders, but identified with it, as our own sins, we have sinned, we have done wrong. Shame upon us, O oh God, because your integrity is at stake here. People are questioning your credibility because we lead and we live as Christians in your name, in the name of Jesus. So that is just to say right up front, my first response is for mercy and grace, forgiveness. God would help us. God would deal with us. Secondly, just to say that... Um, I came across an interesting article by Will Jervis, G-E-R-V-A-I-S, and I have the link in, in, my, in my paper. Re, a, a social psychologist who was a whole team of social psychologists did research, and basically they found, um, you know, you need a, a certain minimum of respondents through questionnaires to be authoritative in uh, statistics and conclusions if you do social psychology research and they found essentially that there is no big difference qualitative difference between the behavior of christians and the behavior of of non-christians and there was re religious people and even atheists they research atheists and they call it what they uh, what they've termed the religious congruence fallacy, that there is no evidence for a, a difference between your religious beliefs, attitudes, and behavior compared to religious people and, and non-religious people, and even self-identifying atheists. Um, and, and, and I mean, the shame and the crisis is that uh, our beliefs as Christians, which then beliefs form attitudes, which then form behavior, that uh, there is no um, consistency between what we say we believe and how we behave, because our behavior betrays our belief. And of course, beliefs is not what you say you believe. Beliefs are seen in your behavior. Your sustained, regular, predictable behavior over years reveals 
what you really believe, whether you say you believe it or not. And so they have a quote here from the article. They say, studies conducted among American Christians have found that participants donated more money to charity and even watched less pornography on Sundays. However, they compensated on both accounts during the rest of the week. So it's again this uh, incongruence between Sunday we worship God and we try to behave, but for the rest of the week the real uh, character pops out <laughs> and is very consistent with the, the regular way we, we, we think and we speak and we, and we behave. And uh, unfortunately, it is very much more a copy of the world. The church is more a mirror of broken, sinful society than, uh, than um, a model of God's kingdom come on earth. Jesus came to bring the future rule and reign of God to earth. And the gospel of the kingdom has the power to transform people, not only forgive their sins, but to transform them morally incrementally towards Christ likeness so that the church Christians become a, a, a witness an example of a different way of thinking a different way of living a different way of speaking that is the envy of society we are the hope of the world we are a witness of kingdom come and not not a mirror or a copy of sinful society so that's the first crisis is that there's a crisis of, of credibility and how do we how do we really account for that and i would just simply say from dallas willard it's what we have uh, we've preached uh, the wrong gospel which does not lead to discipleship to jesus and therefore fundamental transformation and dallas willard talks about the gospel on the right and the gospel on the left, which are gospels of sin management. In other words, we just preach a gospel that the blood of Jesus forgives you of your sin, and then, then you, have, you, you, you have managed your personal sin problem through the vampire gospel of Jesus, give me a bit of your blood so that I can be forgiven and have a ticket to get into heaven. The personal gospel of forgiveness of sins does not transform people in their moral behavior incrementally so that eventually <laughs> temptation loses its power over you and doesn't have any interest or enticement and in fact when it comes your way eventually it's just it's just so repulsive that uh, there is nothing in you that responds to it um, the gospel on the left on the left hand, Dallas Willard says, is the social gospel of social sin management, structural sin, that if we just change structural injustice, systemic sins, then people will change and people will be good and fine. And so both of those gospels, the private personal gospel of personal sin management and the social gospel of social sin management, don't have the power to really transform people. And the gospel of the kingdom does. So the gospel of the kingdom is where Jesus becomes king of our hearts, of our lives, of our, of our marriage, of our family, of our business and work life, of our churches, of the whole of my life. And when Jesus truly rules and reigns, then sin cannot rule and reign for any length of time within me. If I allow sin, repeated patterns of sin, to rule and reign in me under Jesus' kingship as a Christian, when Jesus is king in my heart and life, I can only do that by compartmental, compartmentalizing that part in me and separating it out from the whole of who I am and sear my conscience in regard to that area of repeated sin and where Jesus is not king. So that is what Lord has the phrase from Matthew chapter 6, verse 10, where Jesus taught us to pray, let your kingdom come, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The kingdom of God is where the will of God is done. He says the kingdom of God is the effective range of God's will. 
Where God's will is done, his kingdom has come. Where God's will is not done, his kingdom has not yet come. So in my life as a person, we have this capacity in the psychology of the human being. And what Jeremiah calls the corruption of our hearts. It says the heart of the human being in chapter 17 verse 9 is desperately wicked and deceitful above all things. Who can know it? It is so deep with mixed motives that only the Lord God knows the depth of our hearts. So we have this capacity to say, Jesus, you are my Lord, you are Savior, I love you, I worship you, and yet compartmentalize a part in us that actually continues to, to pursue sin in a certain area of our lives. And that then, once, like sexuality with Ravi Zacharias, and then eventually the use of spiritual explanations in the sexual encounters to justify them, which is spiritual abuse, then eventually paying off some woman from a ministry fund to support the single mother and their child because she's giving him sexual favors when he got massages. Uh, so uh, that is then financial abuse, spiritual abuse, sexual abuse. So what happens within us as followers of Jesus, let alone with leaders, the average ordinary Christian, is that if we, if we sin, we, we feel guilty, the Holy Spirit convicts us, and we come to Jesus as 1 John chapter 1 verse, verse 9 says, we confess our sin, we ask Jesus to forgive us, he forgives us, he's faithful and just to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. <laughs> our faithful high priest at the right hand of the Father who makes intercession for us, and his blood does cleanse us, and we are forgiven. But if we sin and we don't confess it to Jesus, and we, we, we hold it, then a shadow comes between Jesus and me. And our conscience uh, starts being bothered and uh, tolerates this unresolved um, shadow or darkness that I actually keep uh, between Jesus and me because I'm not honest. I don't come clean and I don't confess to Jesus. Then one sin that is unresolved and unconfessed easily leads to a second sin in that same area, then a third sin. And so it becomes a pattern of sin. And a pattern of sin eventually becomes a habit. And a habit eventually becomes what psychologists call an addiction. So as the little girl, and I've used this um, little uh, uh, illustration often in these kind of talks, as the little girl at Sunday school said, when she said to all the children, what is a lie? And the little girl put her hand up. She said, a lie is an abomination to God and an ever-present help in times of trouble. <laughs> and, of course, we laugh about that because for many of us, lies, white lies, for white people, are an ever-present help in times of trouble. When you're in trouble, just lie, and then you get out of it. And so Jesus called Satan the father of lies because the way sin... And then through sin, death entered into God's pristine creation in the garden was through the serpent lying to Eve and lying to Adam. Did God really say that if you eat of the fruit that you will die? Don't you know better than that? Don't you know that if you eat, you'll be God? You will satisfy the lust of the eyes. Your desire when you look at this fruit, uh, the desire of the flesh. And it will make you like God. You will be, uh, uh, um, yeah, you, you'll, you'll know what God knows. You'll have what God has. And so this idolatry of self-worship, me, myself, and I at the, at the end of the day, what's good for me, what I feel like, my sexual rights, my entitlement, my satisfaction. So just to say that we go down this road, and it's what the Bible in the, in the New Testament calls besetting sins. Um, I, that's from Hebrews chapter 12. Looking to Jesus, let us throw aside anything and everything that entangles us in sin. The old King James language is good. 
besetting sins. It's what David calls in Psalm 19, secret sins. Forgive me of the sins of my youth. Forgive me my secret sins. So this idea of living, developing a secret life of brokenness in a certain area of our human personality. And to tolerate it, we actually have to start closing off our conscience to that area of life and keep it away from Jesus and other people and, and incrementally hide it. That leads to, to the corruption of character. So lying is the beginning of the corruption of character, of ducking and diving and hiding, where we no longer walk in the light as Jesus is in the light, but we actually allow a shadow to become a darkness, to become eventually a wall that cordons off that particular area of our life, and to end up like Ravi Zacharias and John Vinay and others, abusing women, being a predator, over many years, not just the one night stand, but over many years, you have to actually overcome your conscience to then start being a predator that actually abuses, abuses people. And that's way down the road of character corruption and character malformation in this area. And you get this incredible anomaly, this unbelievable duplicity of being able to be on international public platforms and uh, have the most brilliant mind with amazing theology and insight, and yet such inner hidden corrupted character and malformation that you not only sin, but you become a predator and abuser and justify it in the moment with spiritualizing stories of union with God and then paying people off to keep quiet by supporting them monthly out of ministry funds. I mean, it's just, it's just one wants to weep when you, when, you, when you think of it carefully. And, you know, in one way, we can all get there. <laughs> We, we all are sinners, and we can all end up there if we don't guard our hearts. In another way, it takes a long progressive journey to get to that place of brokenness. So one sin is one sin. Patterns of sin have got to be really, really taken seriously and broken with the help of the Holy Spirit, bringing it to the light of accountability. Patterns of sin that are eventually unresolved become the power of evil that starts gaining control of that comp compartmentalized part of us. And whatever is separated out of the whole of us begins to drive us. And that's what the Bible calls demonizations, what psychologists call addictions. It, 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 it acquires a power over us, beyond us. And so that is what the, uh, the Latin church, the early church in the, in the Western church, called the seven deadly sins or the seven vices, the Eastern church, the, the Eastern monastic movement called the eight passions. And I just want to read them in my book, Doing Spiritu um, Spirituality, uh, on page 253. It's gluttony is, is the first one. So we all have our vices. We all have our little foxes that spoil the vine the garden of our hearts that God has entrusted to us. And if we don't catch those foxes <laughs> that spoil the vine, <laughs> they actually end up gaining control and wreaking havoc in the rest of us. Eventually, when God hands us over to our lusts, hands us over to our unresolved sinful patterns. You know, the, the worst judgment God paid on Israel was to give them over to the idolatry of the worship of foreign gods by sending them into exile to be ruled by foreign gods and powers. And in Romans chapter 1, Paul gives a progressive uh, process, a downward spiral of corruption and decay, denying the knowledge of God, suppressing the truth that God has given to us through creation and his word. That then um, leads to the disillusionment of our mind, whereby in our mind is darkened and we justify sin, which then ends up God handing us over to our corrupted appetites, our unresolved uh, sinful desires. And those 
corrupted appetites, uncrucified flesh, and sinful desires end up driving us with demonic spiritual power so that it becomes who we eventually are. And that will be separation from God. Cast me not away from your presence, Lord. Take not your Holy Spirit from me, Lord, says David in Psalm 51. That was his worst fear. The worst incentive fear in the deepest part of the human being is the cry that Jesus cried on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Is, is, is being separated from the presence of God, not only here in this life, but eternally um, in our immortality is to be separated from God. That is hell. So gluttony is the first vice. Lust, gluttony has to do with our relationship with food. Is that a vice, an unresolved issue in you? A wrong relationship with food. Lust, wrong relationship with sexuality. Were you driven by lust? You know, lust, sexuality, the gift of sexu human sexuality is actually the gift of love of the way we relate to other human beings, both male and female. The way we relate to people is essentially about healthy or broken human sexuality. We either love people in purity, honoring them with the, the passion and warmth of intimacy as the very image of God, or we lust people by using others in the way we treat them and relate to them to achieve our purposes, for our pleasure, for our vision. We use and abuse people in subtle ways for our selfish fulfillment of our desires. That's lust. It's about human sexuality. Greed, which is our relationship with materiality. Money. Then the psychological vices, anger. Unresolved patterns of anger can lead to all sorts of stuff in our lives that drive us eventually with rage. And a lot of Christians have got a lot of unresolved anger in them. Envy which is about, um, I'm just going to move my computer because I see the light is coming through on my face <laughs> from the window. Uh, envy, uh, uh, that's jealousy about others' good fortune. Dejection, which is about the slothfulness, list, listlessness. Uh, pride is the last one, which is about power and self-esteem. So I thought I'd just mention those vices because that is what happens in the process of the corruption of our character, which ultimately and eventually leads to a double secret life, as, as Ravi Zacharias um, experienced. And so having said that, let me just say that personal responsibility is primary, and we need to put to death any unresolved issue in us, um, or else eventually it, it begins to... Um, gain power and the way we we put to death that is bring it to the light of confession and hold ourselves accountable to the lord through personal confession but also to brothers and sisters and that's why james says that if anyone um basically is caught in a sin go and confess to one another confess your faults your failings to one another and pray for each other so that you may be healed uh, in terms of other contributory factors, and I'm at the end of my talk, so I just want to mention this briefly from my paper. So personal responsibility obviously always is primary, but with a situation of fallen leaders like uh, Ravi Zacharias, even Bill Hybels um, and Carl Lentz and others that have, uh, there are many names one can mention, there is also other contributory factors. I'm just going to mention them that I've listed. The one is leaders are often lonely with no real personal friends, and especially when it comes to men. So leadership in the church today is still by far the majority, 90% are male leaders in terms of senior leaders of churches and Christian organizations. And men notoriously don't know how to be vulnerable and have safe places of other male friendships, like David and Jonathan friendships, where we can have a safe place to live a disclosed life and confess our emotional pain and rejection. Because behind pornography and masturbation, behind lust, behind these things, 
his broken masculinity, his hurt and pain, rejection from childhood. There are reasons for this that we don't go and get healing from and hold ourselves accountable in these safe places of transparent David-Jonathan friendships among as men. Uh, the second reason is the deeper issue of toxic broken masculinity, which I've alluded to already. But I have a phrase that I use in men's talks that where, where um, our sexuality and our spirituality meet, that is, the, that is in the deepest place, in the deepest core of our identity of who we are as men. So male sexuality and masculine spirituality are either friends that are transparent and intimate and integrated, or they are foes, enemies, that are, have a relationship of guilt and shame because I lust and so I feel guilty and bad and I fail and I go and confess. And so I do this personal sin management unless it gains power over me. And so there is a separation between our sexuality and spirituality. And we live in this broken, toxic mess um, inside of us. So, so toxic, broken masculinity and broken you know, male sexuality is also at the root and the, the core of abusive male leadership. Underlying evangelical theology of, 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 um, of male sexuality and, and also male headship. So I've made a comment here that a lot of the popular evangelical books on marriage teach a form of sexuality, especially when it comes to male sexuality, that actually I think has contributed to, to the, 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 the secret feeling of entitlement among men. You know, phrases like to wives, wives, you must give it to your husbands or else we'll go look for it elsewhere. Uh, you know, men are sexually driven. There are a lot of these phrases and, and um, implications in a lot of popular evangelical teaching about marriage and sexuality and singleness that actually create an image that men are, are monsters. Men are sexual monsters. They, they have a sexual appetite that cannot be controlled. And uh, Paul says, you better get married or else you're going to lust and burn. So get married and wives, you must just serve your husband sexually. And it really is, is a wrong, completely wrong, male, old, toxic, patriarchal view of sexuality that we need to rethink and change. Um, in fact, Paul's reference to sex and marriage in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 is radically, is radical mutuality is not male-dominated cultural theology of male headship. He, he says that our bodies don't belong to one another and we mutually serve one another in the intimacy of marriage sexually for mutual uh, spiritual protection against temptation of the evil one. So number four is the refusal to take women's accusations seriously. And uh, just to say that notoriously men don't listen to women generally and our fragile male egos are quickly threatened when when women give us honest feedback and the many of you know my dear wife she's a very honest upfront person so pray for me <laughs> but uh, women that are honest and in your face and have no problem of being under the under the the psycho-emotional domination of men and say it as it is back to men, how they experience you directly and clearly is actually for very few men take women seriously and listen objectively without becoming defensive and without uh, um, then the, these innuendos and implications of a Jezebel spirit. The woman is the temptress. You see, manipulation and all of these stereotypes that we still have deeply ingrained in the male sexist mind that goes back generations. That is part of our problem in what has brought us to this place in the church. And then number five, organizational culture and celebrity status. So in especially mega churches and large Christian organizations, there is uh, this 
culture in the organization where they allow the man of God to become a celebrity. And of course, with that comes all sorts of, of pressure. Um, so we must be very, very careful of allowing any sense of celebrity status around the team leader, the senior pastor, the man of God. And the whole issue of the culture of honor and the way we honor leaders, we have to be very careful because there's a, there's a teaching of a culture of honor that uh, has some good elements in it, but doesn't have good, um, other good elements. As an example, this thing of titles, apostle so-and-so, prophet so-and-so. And when you invite the man of God to the platform, you've got to get everyone to stand up on their feet and, and give a person a standing ovation. I cringe when that happens. It's, it's just not right. It feeds unmet eager needs within leaders and especially male leaders for our need and desire for admiration and a lot of leaders have unmet ego needs that are fed by this um, implicit culture of celebrity of honoring the man of god the key leader which is very unhealthy and it contributes to this because then the leader gets a sense of entitlement and i'm finishing off Lack of oversight and accountability within the core teams of elders, board of directors, the lack of hands-on diligent oversight and accountability, and uh, the directors of Ravi Zacharias Ministries International uh, must have known something was happening, and especially when Laurie Thompson accused Ravi Zacharias over a period of a year, they covered it all up, dismissed it, and they do gaslighting. The same with Bill Hybels and the elders in Willow Creek. They made the woman who came forward and accused him of inappropriate behavior, they made them think that they are the perpetrators, the manipulators, the temptresses, and the Jezebels. And uh, then you think you're going crazy as a woman. So this accountability issue within the team is very important to hold leaders accountable and lastly, big platforms and big donor money to keep the show on the road in the fear of it all disappearing. So therefore, leaders are not held accountable and not, and not corrected and disciplined and told to step back. Because if they are, the whole thing falls apart. The money no longer comes in and we can no longer do what we're doing. And all of our jobs are on the line. So that's the sad conclusion and the tragedy. And those are the things we need to be careful for in churches. And in organizations. So when I've taken the full time, it's now 14 minutes past seven and we can discuss. <laughs> Thanks Alexander. This is the second time that I've listened to Alexander on this topic. Torsten and I attended his talk a few weeks ago and just to say there's, there's so much that you've touched on Alexander. I mean there's just a lot. I think a lot of it comes out of your own history of, of pastoring local churches, a lifetime in ministry, and then also leadership, national leadership, and consulting with a lot of other pastors and leaders. So just to say that, I mean, even listening to you again on this, um, there's a lot just to reflect on, I think, individually. So yeah, I would encourage you, if you, if you can, to get the recording of this. We always make it available, and um, also just to deeply reflect on some of these things. Anyhow, that said, uh, if you would like to ask a question or a comment, you're welcome to raise your hand. If you unmute yourself, you'll jump to the top of my list, or you can um, post something in the chat box. Okay, so Pepe says, do you think that independent church leaders, in other words, non-denominational movements, independent churches, are at greater risk of falling because they don't have a higher a higher leadership, a council or such that, that keeps them in check. And Pepe, I would say um, in general, yes, that independent churches and independent church leaders that don't belong in any formal accountable relationship to a broader leadership structure um, are more vulnerable to developing um, unaccountable attitudes and behavior and developing a secret life um, of sin in this way. 
But um, the, the tragedy is many denominational leaders equally develop a secret life, a double life in leadership, even though they're supposed to be accountable uh, to broader and, and senior leaders within the movement of churches. And the key here is to hold ourselves accountable to others and our leaders and not wait until they have to come and call us to account. Uh, spiritual formation towards Christ-likeness means that incrementally, the longer I live as a leader, the more quick I am to go and hold myself accountable to my peers and my leaders and not wait for others to come and call me to account over a particular issue that's happened or some tension or some feedback that's come. So, um, yeah, but independence is a, a vulnerable place to be that allows the enemy to pick you off easily. Thanks, Alexander, for the talk. I think, I think the one thing that's kind of so unsettling about this whole thing is that there was a lot of truth that Ravi Zacharias did preach and some of his teaching was good etc and then there's aspects of his lifestyle that were definitely unacceptable and non-christian and it's it's that clash that makes it so difficult because you know to to non-christians watching on that, that almost in their mind justifies writing off the the truth that he may well have been teaching and yeah, you know, I mean, I don't know. You, you kind of go to the point um, when you see that unregenerate lifestyle, and was he ever saved, and those sorts of questions. And I, yeah, <laughs> I don't know if you can elaborate a little bit more on that. I mean, he, he, is, was he? I mean, he's just a sinner like the rest of us, or was he ever saved? So, yeah. So, Marty, look again. What you are raising is very important. And one can say a whole lot. Look, I have no doubt in my mind that Rabbi Zacharias was born again by the Holy Spirit, was a follower of Jesus, a great Christian apologist, and in many ways um, very, very helpful. But obviously developed this secret life of sin that then eventually overtook him and drove him, whereby he could no longer control it and eventually he could no longer hide it. Um, and then, so just know that the human beings have this capacity within them to live this kind of double life. It doesn't make Ravi Zacharias an unsaved person, um, in my opinion and my understanding. Uh, God knows how he will uh, discipline or whatever happens with Ravi Zacharias is in the hands of God. I think from our point of view, we need to say that, um, uh, you know, we, we can learn from Ravi Zacharias's writings and teachings, but now with open eyes and a different understanding and frame of mind because of what we know about the life that he lived at least for six years before he died, the last six years before he died. That's the evidence. So I would not recommend his books unless... In recommending a particular book to a leader or person that wants to read in a certain area, I would give the disclaimer and the explanation, read it carefully with the knowledge that this happened um, so that you are aware. But it doesn't mean we just throw the guy out and banish him in a, into outer darkness. Um, God is the judge. God knows how to deal with it ultimately. So we can still learn, but with the disclaimer, so I would not personally recommend his books. I would not personally refer people to him unless I give disclaimers and explain so that they do read it with a discerning heart and a discerning mind. And then just your last comment, Marty, is that, yeah, look, we are all sinners and we all do wrong and we all need God's mercy. But what we're talking about here with Rabbi Zacharias is a different order of, uh, of brokenness that was a sustained pattern of uh, behavior over six, possibly 10 years. Um, so that is a different order. And believe you me, before we get into that level and order of brokenness and behavior, you've got to go through a long period of conditioning. It doesn't happen overnight. So um, I don't think we can all 
end up doing what Ravi did? Uh, theoretically, yes. But practically, it'll take a long time before your brokenness of character and all the schemings and machinations of hiding things and developing a secret life and lying and covering up are so skilled that it can go on year in and year out for a long time. So it's, it's just a different order of things. I hope because Andre, I'm going to ask you quickly, you're going to have to answer these quite um, quickly because now all of a sudden, or just be brief, there's a lot of questions coming thick and fast. We have developed many Christians who now become street angels, but house, angels, house devils. This is the result of a secret lie. Yeah, thank you for that, Jana. And then um, the next question after that was by Rahadi. Uh, how do we help institutions to become accountable? In most cases, charismatic leaders co-opt the organization in covering for them, as in Ravi Zechariah Ministries, and in the case of the Roman Catholic Church. Reputation took precedence over accountability. So again, this is a complicated issue because of the deceitfulness of the human heart. I think that leaders, leadership teams, boards, trustees, directors think that they are giving oversight and holding the team leader accountable, but it's not the same level of accountability that it really is really that is needed and required of transparency. Um, and of course, likewise, from the leaders, the team leaders point of view, don't, not holding themselves accountable. So we need to find ways and means of greater transparency, greater uh, courageous arm's length. There's nothing personal here, arm's length accountability with leaders. And I, have got five questions that I used with a colleague of mine, Bruce Boynes, over many years when he stayed in community with us on a farm and worked with me. We met with each other regularly and we went through five questions, the hard questions, in terms of our relationship with God. How's your integrity with God? How's your integrity with your wife and your family? How is your integrity with your, in your work life, in your recreation, your rest and renewal, and in your private thoughts? your sexual life. And then in answering the five questions, we had a sixth question. Have you lied to me in any of your answers around these five questions? <laughs> so we need to hold, accountability needs to be radical, dispassionate by being um, in your face and asking the hard questions ongoingly so that we live in the light and we keep ourselves from this corruption of character. Mm. So, that's a short Thanks, answer. Then. Yeah, and then Deline's question was around toxic masculinity. How do we strengthen healthy male role modeling in a country with ingrained um, gender-based violence and patriarchy? Yeah. Big one. So, De so Deline, this, this is the jackpot question, the million dollar question, and this is the Mount Everest in South Africa. We have the Alps in South Africa, Mont Blanc, the Matterhorn, which are other issues, but the Mount Everest is this abuse of men against women and children that happens every 26 seconds. A woman and or child is raped in this country on average by a so-called man or male. So this is, this is a massive, massive issue. And we men are particularly uh, responsible to address this and to actually um, work with men's issues so I do, I've got six standard talks on men's issues, 10, where I do men's conferences or men's retreats. And I always say when I do this, I would offer myself to go anywhere, literally around the world, to do a men's conference or men's retreat with men to do these six talks, where men work with their stuff and they face their stuff. Because this is the Mount Everest. This is the, 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 the big thing. <laughs> and uh, we men have got to call each other to account and be in, in each other's face for the sake of healing from toxic, broken masculinity and residual sexist patriarchal attitudes that are deeply, deeply ingrained that most men don't even know are there. 
But women experience, and if they are honest with how they experience us, and they tell us, they feed back to us how they experience men, men would be shocked if women were really honest with the way they experience us. And we really desperately need help. So Deline, there's much to say, but maybe I should stop there. Um, Wayne? We'll try to do two more questions um, um, and then yeah, see if we can still end at uh, 7.30. Um, yeah, Seb, could you comment on the relationship between ego accountability and the sense of self-entitlement? All right. So, um, Seb, un unmet ego needs. In other words, if we as Christians and followers of Jesus don't draw draw from Jesus the affirmation and the identity that we need as being his beloved one, his son and his daughter. Unresolved ego needs make us vulnerable to then uh, feelings of entitlement and, and uh, lack of accountability and, and other things. In the kingdom of God, as disciples of Jesus, our only entitlement is is um, the love of the Father because of the Son. God's gift of Jesus to all of us is his gift of love that actually is our identity. And so any other sense of entitlement of my rights, my this, my that, we have to hold lightly as followers of Jesus and find our, our needs, our ego needs, our fulfillment in the love of God that defines us and identifies us. Otherwise, we will look for it out, outside, elsewhere with other people and other things. Then we begin to feed off those things in a subtle way. And before we realize it, we catch ourselves actually developing an attitude that is inappropriate. And then we realize we've already gone down a road where unmet ego needs are seducing us because we've not drawn on our personal discipleship to Jesus, where we've been enveloped in the love of the Father, affirmed in the love of the Father, and identified in the love of the Father. So this is, for me, the, at the heart of the issue. Oh, good. Thanks, Alexander. And now I think the last question we're going to take, because we are out of time now, is from, from Dave in Arusha. Thanks, Dave. When uh, back in about 82... Uh, when I not long come back to the Lord, there were two churches. We were with the Christian Missionary Alliance in Australia. And, um, and Ravi came out to spend two weeks. Two small churches, about 100 or so, uh, paid for him to come out and uh, spend a week in each of our churches. And we took turns. Uh, at that time, he, uh, in the first week, he lost his voice. And uh, so he couldn't come to our church for the second week. And he left and went back to Canada. And he, he made a promise. He said, uh, you know, I'm going to honor this, um, this commitment that I've made. And um, I was, you know, I looked at him because he was the mighty man of God, the way he was, even with us being small churches, he was lauded big time way back then. And, and I thought as a young Christian, um, I, I don't know if he's going to do this. And, and so when you were uh, talking, Alexander, about starting with the white lies, um, I think um, that is very important. Uh, you know, and, and I, uh, he never got back to us to explain why he couldn't come or, or refunded money or anything like that. But he was too big uh, to um, be distracted, I guess by that so so it was something that kind of went into every i never ever forgot that even though he got bigger and bigger over time and was a caution to my own heart say you know let your yes be yes and your no be no and, and that was from a from a new christian yeah now, thank you for sharing that david the personal story and experience appreciate that so alexander again Thank you very much. Um, as I said, there are many thanks coming on the chat, but um, a lot to think about and to contemplate.